and once again, welcome everybody. Um, I was very fortunate to meet many of you last September, so I'm very much looking forward to seeing many of you later on this year now that many of the restrictions are being lifted. Without further ado, I'm now going to hand over to our Cabinet Member, Councillor Spiros Vasilou, um, to, introduce, um, to introduce the conference um, from his perspective. So over to you, um, Councillor Vasilou. Thank you, Mary. And hello, everybody. Uh, pleased to be able to join you again, although sadly it's not in person this time. But thank you to all of you for being here virtually. Uh, and a really special thanks uh, goes out to Lepsa, Sean, and the rest of the tenant engagement team for organizing this session. So I hope you'll enjoy the evening, which promises to give you a valuable insight into the work we're doing in your communities and across the city, and the opportunities available to you to get involved and have your say. So before I get into what's coming up, uh, I'd just like to firstly acknowledge the work many of you have been doing throughout the pandemic to support your neighbours and communities. Your commitment was really clear to see at the September's conference, where I was delighted to meet so many of you and celebrate the stars of the community who've gone the extra mile over the last couple of years. I'm sure I speak for everyone here when I say that your efforts really are very much appreciated and your roles as involved tenants, whether it's block reps, tenant inspectors, green space monitors or forum members have never been so more important. So I was delighted to have the opportunity since the summer conference to meet up with some tenants to discuss in detail our, administ our administration's plan and positive direction for going forward and to be able to answer many questions that you all had. I was also really happy to meet with the tenant inspectors just the other week who talked me through their new report on council housing stigma and we discussed how the council can play a vital and key role in helping to prevent this from happening in the future. So please do continue to make the most of opportunities to feed back into our services, tell us what we're doing well, tell us what we could be doing better, and remember to take part in the poll at the end of this evening's session, as Mary has indicated, to help us deliver a great tenant conference in the future. So at the last meeting, I spoke uh, to you all about the superb new council homes that have been delivered in Lords Hill, Millbrook and Town Hill Park. And it's been lovely to hear that many re residents were able to move into their new homes late last year and enjoy Christmas in their new surroundings. I'm pleased to say that moving forward, we're working on an exciting new strategy in partnership with housing associations and developers so we can realise our aspirations to create even more affordable homes for council rent, affordable rent and shared ownership amounting to approximately 27,000 new homes across the city by 2040. At the forefront of these plans, and indeed our work maintaining the existing housing stock, is the need to make our homes as energy efficient as, as possible, which Ola Onabayo will be taking us through later on in this session. When I first took over as your cabinet member for housing in May last year, I realized that a lot of households were continuing to feel the pressure of squeezed incomes and rising bills. My cabinet colleagues and I therefore wanted to do what we could to help people as much as possible. So in more good news, I'm delighted to be able to tell you that we'll be freezing rent and service charges this next financial year to give you one less thing to worry about. Kevin Harlow, our, our finance business partner, will be joining us later to talk through this and other financial matters in more detail. But despite the rent and service charge freeze, we remain committed to delivering high quality, value for money, a good housing service that you expect, particularly when it comes to keeping our estates clean and tidy. We also realize that fly tipping continues to blight communities and more needs to be done to ensure household waste and recycling is disposed of in the most best responsible way. Finally, you remember that my role covers culture. And I'm delighted that you'll be hearing a little bit more from Mary Darcy later on about our bid to become the UK City of Culture in 2025. 
And you'll also be hearing from our events manager, Craig Linton, about plans to mark the Queen's Platinum Jubilee this summer. Both these occasions will provide opportunities to show pride in our city, pride in our country, and pride in our heritage. And I urge you all to get involved if you can. So in closing, I just want to wish you all a wonderful 2022, and I hope to be able to see you all in person again very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Vassalou, and uh, great to highlight what's coming up um, as we go through the agenda. So with, um, I would like now, please, to welcome Megan Adlin from Travis Perkins. Megan is the Group Sustainability Director for Travis Perkins, and... Uh, and is going to talk to us today about the work that Travis Perkins, who are a really, really valuable partner for us here in the council, um, are, are the work that they are doing to look at being a sustainable organisation and how that translates into the work that we do with Travis Perkins. So welcome, Me Megan, um, and over to you. Thanks very much, Mary. Uh, th thanks for inviting me along. It's great to be able to speak with you all today. Um, yeah, so I'm going to share a bit about how we are um, working to be a very sustainable partner for you uh, and also importantly about what that means for you so how we can help you to be more sustainable um, so if you go to the first slide michael please thank you um, just to set the scene we, we developed a, a new group purpose and ambition and three purpose goals last year as part of our new strategy which we launched to the market and um, you can see from the the statements on the screen here that we are taking our role as the leading building materials supplier to the UK market very seriously. And we recognize the responsibility we have to make a difference and drive the sustainability agenda forward. So three purpose goals there, decarbonizing our industry, helping to change construction and developing the next generation, the work streams and uh, the potential, you know, the support that will be developed for customers through um, achieving those purpose goals will, will really support Southampton Council. So if you go to the next slide, please, Michael. Thank you. Uh, to, to kind of paint a picture, we, we have been setting industry leading targets of our own. Uh, so from a carbon perspective, we've set carbon reduction targets in line with a 1.5 degree pathway. So that includes an 80% reduction for our operational carbon. That's our own estates and our own fleet. We've got about 2,000 sites and probably about 4,000 vehicles, a lot of them quite hard to decarbonize, big HDVs with cranes on the back moving heavy materials around. So we've really set ourselves a very powerful agenda. Um, and then for scope three, which is our supply chain emissions, a 63% reduction by 2035, which is also in line with a 1.5 degree pathway. That's the bit that's most of interest to you because the scope one and two bit means that we as a partner to you are decarbonizing our business. Scope three means we're decarbonizing suppliers' products. We're going to help you to decarbonize and um, how we're supporting decarbonization of the built environment. So if you move to the next slide, please, Michael. Great, thank you. So how does this help you? I'm going to talk through four ways that I think that what the work we're doing here can really help you. Firstly, giving you the right products. So as we are looking to retrofit properties and, and decarbonize them, make them more thermally efficient, stop using fossil fuels, you, you're going to be needing different products from us. And we're making sure that we've got the products in place, the supply chains, chains in place ready to support you. Also, it's not always from a product perspective, just about having different products. It's sometimes about being able to share with you the alternate products that you could be considering that um, are, are not perhaps new technologies. So even in some of the day-to-day -day products that you use for repairs, you know, if you're using a throwaway plastic sealant gun, can we recommend to you the reusable one with the foil um, sausages that go inside it? And uh, it, it, so it, it isn't just about the big system changes and thermal efficiency. I think across the suite of products that you use, we're keen to support you in selecting better and understanding the products more. If you go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So that's partly about the right data. So it's not just about having the right products. We want to help you to really visibly be able to choose differently. Um, so instead of just sharing with you price and tech spec, which I think most of us will have done to date, um, we're looking at how we can now tell you across product ranges, 
what the embodied carbon is, perhaps the percentage recycled content, the location of final manufacture, because local sourcing is becoming increasingly important, particularly to the public sector. Um, has the timber that we've supplied to you got certification, that kind of thing? I mean, I've put a reassurance on here for you that 98% of the timber we, we sold in 2020, we're just running the 21 stats. I don't expect them to be any lower than this. Um, you know, we, we do, we do, we're the biggest um, supplier of uh, chain of custody timber to the UK market. But what we want to understand is what attributes are most important to you, and then we're, we're going to work with manufacturers to get them. So thirdly, value add services. It's not just about the right products and the right data. What value add services can we offer to help you with your sustainability goals as well? Are you interested in understanding the delivery carbon from us to you and how we reduce that, how we support you in managing um, distribution of products and uh, perhaps van stock solutions, that kind of thing, which will really help to, to reduce carbon. Um, also, um, carbon offsetting potential. Can we take back surplus materials? Support you in upskilling local uh, local communities. We've done that with some other customers and cre created, for example, advice sheets for tenants to think about how to um, improve uh, energy efficiency in the home and um, a draft proofing and you know some 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 guidance that helps with the use of the property, not just the products that that, that make it up. And then fourthly, um, the, the next slide, please, Mike, thank you. Um, trusted supply chains. So I, I think it's it's increasingly important for all of our customers to feel confident that they're buying from manufacturers via a trusted dis um, distributor like, Man like, like Travis Perkins, um, manufacturers that have been assessed so that you can feel reassured that we are driving out the risk of modern slavery in supply chains and um, other social concerns that we have about workforces in global supply chains. Um, so we, we have a, a set of supplier commitments and we assess our suppliers against those using both an online risk assessment and also factory audits for our own brand product sites. Um, manage corrective action plans with those suppliers and we're, we're, we're supporting them with training and upskilling so that we can really close the common gaps that we've been seeing. Um, embodied carbon is a key measure when we work up and suppliers and we're helping those that haven't done it yet to calculate carbon for the first time and, and take this seriously. So in a nutshell, we are very keen to support you with your sustainability goals and there's a number of ways that we can do it but then it boils down to us being a partner for you that is committed to lead the industry on sustainability so you can trust us to lead by example in our own business and set leading targets i've listed carbon there but it's true across the broader sustainability agenda including people development, closing the skills gap, diversity and inclusion, responsible sourcing it's a it's a broad agenda and we're setting leading targets across all of these areas um, and, and finally oh sorry providing products and services to support your sustainability goals and the, the, the final comment on there is just to remind you that the next wave of funding is coming um, for the decarbonization fund for social housing um, the indications are from Bayes that, uh, that your bids are, are far more likely to be successful if you have an established supply chain as part of a framework ready to deliver the products to you and we're very keen to support you with that. Um, hopefully that's been useful, a little whistle stop tour of what we can do for you but, but any questions very welcome. Thank you. And thank you very much, we're very um, pleased to have a partner like Travis Perkins who takes their responsibilities um, for sustainable practices and sustainable business so, so very seriously. Um, because it is a journey that, that we are on as a council to work towards um, developing carbon neutral plans, but also a journey that we've actually been on for some time in terms of thinking about how, how we support our tenants and our buildings um, to, be, um, to be as energy efficient as, as we can make them. And, and as Councillor Vassilou said, we'll be hearing more about that later from, from our asset management team. So I'm going to move on now to um, an update from Kevin Harlow, who is our finance business partner. Now, Kevin can't be with us today, um, but Kevin has um, recorded a video outlining um, what the, the proposals are that will be taken forward to the budget meeting at full council in, in, in February. Councillor Vassilou has uh, headlined some of those already. Um, and uh, I think I will be asking Michael to now play the video. 
Good evening. My name is Kevin Harlow and I am the finance business partner supporting the housing revenue account. And over the next few slides, I would like to cover the housing revenue account budgets and rent proposals for 2022 straight 23. Firstly, I would like to start by looking at the purpose of the housing revenue account and what it means. The housing revenue account is governed by a specific set of legislation namely Schedule 4 of the Local Government Act 1989. This legislation requires us to ring fence tenants' rent and service charges. The purpose of doing this is to ensure that tenants do not pay twice through rent and council tax for general services, and that council taxpayers are not subsidising housing services for which they do not benefit. The Housing Revenue Account will pay for landlord-related expenditure examples of which are repairs and maintenance for housing, fire safety and other compliance inspection works, housing allocations, neighbourhood wardens and so on. The housing revenue account will not cover general fund council services such as standard waste collection, grants maintenance, adult and children's social care, highways maintenance or any other services from which the wider community benefits. Rent and service charges for 22-23. The current government guidelines allow for a maximum increase in rent with consumer price index inflation plus a further 1%. Based on the CPI inflation at September 2021 of 3.1%, the maximum increase allowable for 22-23 would have been 4.1%. Inflation has been significantly higher than in previous years and this is being driven by post-lockdown economic recovery and fuel price increases. However, the proposed rent for next year is a freeze on 2021-22, which means that average rent will remain at £86.81. It is also proposed to freeze service charges at 21-22 levels. This slide shows the service charges proposed for 22-23. As can be seen, the proposed charges are in line with those set for 21-22. Landlord controlled heating charges for 22-23. Unfortunately, as much as we would have liked, the rent proposed freeze does not extend to landlord controlled heating charges. And there will have to be an increase for 22-23. This is necessary to cover the significant cost increases we have seen this year, which have been well in excess of the anticipated 2.5% increase that was budgeted for last year. In addition, our energy suppliers are advising us of cost increases of 6% for next year. The overall increase in charges required to cover this is 16.5%. It has to be said that long-term energy forecasting is subject to fluctuation based on what is happening in the wider economy. This can make forecasting difficult, particularly in these turbulent times, and it cannot allow for unforeseen future circumstances. We will therefore continue to monitor costs carefully over the next 12 months. HRA service plans for 2022-23. The 22-23 business planning process identified a number of cost pressures. The key pressures identified were an additional £2 million to the cyclical maintenance budgets. This is to ensure that resources are in place to meet forthcoming fire and building safety legislation. We've also seen additional costs for national insurance in line with the recent government announcement and general pay inflation. We are also seeing increasing costs of materials for buildings repairs, well in excess of inflation in some cases. These cost increases would appear to be incompatible with a freeze in rent, and we have also had to take some actions to ensure that affordability in the context of the longer term business plans. Some of the actions that we have undertaken are to propose a use of the forecast surplus against the 21 22 budget to support 2223's business plan. 
we have also reviewed the bad debt provision. This relates to rent arrears that cannot be recovered and was significantly increased in the 2020 financial year in response to the pandemic. We have reviewed this and have been able to reduce it based on our collection performance over the last 12 months. We have also reviewed the capital programme to ensure that it is realistic and achievable and also to take into account the new administration's approach to new homes provision. This has ensured a lower cost of borrowing in the medium to long term. At the end of my slides, I would like to thank you all for listening to me. I hope you found it interesting. Kevin, thank you very much for that. Um, actually, um, Kevin is here. Um, I do apologise, Kevin, I didn't realise that you were with us this evening, but thank you for recording that in advance. Um, I think um, everyone on the call will understand that it is a very challenging environment in terms of the wider uh, economic situation within the whole of the country. But as Councillor Vassalou has already indicated, um, the new administration has taken a very bold, brave move to freeze rents and service charges. Um, whilst having to, to, to make those increases um, or propose those increases in, in, heating, in heating charges for, for those who are on those shared heating um, situations. Further information will be sent following the um, budget meeting in February when, that, um, when those proposals will be put forward for final agreement and approval. So I'm going to move on now to our next presentation, which is from Kirsty Bobbitt. Um, Kirsty is from our city services team and works as a development officer within that team. I'm trying to see if I can see you on my screen, Kirsty, but I can't. Kirsty wants to um, talk today about our ambitions to reduce waste and to reduce contamination within our waste and within our recycling, because obviously if we have contaminated recycling, we cannot actually recycle it. So Kirsty, over to you, welcome. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for having me at your housing conference today. Um, so as Mary said, my name's Kirsty, and I work uh, in city services predominantly within waste and recycling on lots of different projects taking place around the city, mainly relating to bin collections. So today I want to talk a bit about how we use our recycling bins at home and how we can work together to improve what we're already doing. So why are we discussing this now? Unfortunately, sites like this won't be all that uncommon to you. Current recycle rates in Southampton are 29.3%. Uh, UK total rate is around about 46%. So we've got a bit of a way to go to catch up with the rest of the country. Recycling has decreased across the city since 2016. And the amount of contamination we're seeing in our recycling that we collect has also increased as well. We are also seeing recyclable items being incorrectly placed into household waste bins and wish cycling causing contamination by well-meaning residents. So wish cycling is putting non-recyclable items into your recycling bin under the impression that they can be recycled. Putting the wrong items in this bin can cause all sorts of issues further up the recycle chain and spoil all the other great work that's being done and all the recycling that's taken place. What are your council doing about this? You probably want to know. So SEC is really keen to try and help make a difference in how much we recycle. We have updated tags that are placed on bins when incorrect items have been placed inside. We are also um, currently updating our website, rolling out new campaigns across our social media, but also billboards around the cities. You know, not everybody's got access um, online. And we are including information this year for, I think, the first time inside the council tax bills that go out every, every March, so that we're trying to reach every resident uh, possible with this message. We've also recruited new drivers and loaders just to combat our staffing issues that we faced last year due to various reasons. And we're working together with multiple departments across the council to highlight the need to improve our recycling. This includes developing more in-depth training for our staff across these departments, which will help them assist you, you, our residents, further. And we are working closely with our local authority partners across Hampshire to share solutions and best practices, and also try and expand what can be collected in your curbside recycle bins. So you might be thinking, why now? Why do we need to change? Well, improving recycling helps save energy, protect the environment and save resources. And we need to start now to improve our recycling to get ready for bigger changes in the coming years due to the environment bill. So my last point I wanted to talk about 
was how you can help with all of this as well. So please, please, can you keep checking what you can recycle locally within SCC and keep up to date with this. As I said, we will be updating our website and we'll also put um, information out to the wider public as well if anything major does change. Please try not to put recyclable items in your household waste bin where at all possible. And also please keep your recycling loose inside your bin, making sure that tins and food packages have been um, rinsed and cleaned. Just because food waste stuck in cans, grease in pizza boxes can actually contaminate the recycling load and make it unrecyclable. If you'd like to do a little bit more and you're able to do a little bit more and you'd like to recycle additional items that we don't currently take curbside, you can take lots more items to your household waste recycling centre or even local supermarkets. A lot of them are supporting um, additional recycling schemes like soft plastics and battery recycling. But if you're in any doubt with what can or can't go in your bin, then please, please check with us or leave out of your recycling until you're able to confirm. Our website for those who are online is available 24 seven and we also have a chat box on there that's actually really good. It's programmed with quite a lot of information. We also have a digital team available on Facebook, Twitter and web chat, Monday to Friday from 8.30 to 8. And also our customer service telephone based team are available to take calls and answer questions weekdays as well, generally between 8.30 and 5, I believe. And lastly, I just wanted to leave you on remembering the three R's. So they are reduce. So if you can reduce what you buy to prevent any waste. Reuse, reuse any items you can or repurpose. But if you've got something that's maybe not completely through and you don't want to throw it out, consider giving it to friends in need or local charity shops that can be reused. And where possible, please recycle as much as possible. So thank you very much for having me. And um, as I've said, uh, as we said before, if you've got any questions, please do leave them in the chat and I'll be happy to answer them. Kirsty, thank you very much. I can't see any specific com comments in the chat. Um, but I would um, echo your comments about the chatbot actually being very good at being able to, to answer questions. And I know that we want to help all of our residents to understand um, how they can recycle, what they can recycle. I can absolutely understand that it can at times feel to be quite confusing. Um, we want to, we'll be um, working on this over the coming year to try and help people to, to understand those messages. Vicky's put in the chat that, um, that we've, that they've, to her meeting, they've got some support from our waste team. So I'm pleased to hear that, Vicky. And if there are other meetings or groups where it'd be helpful to have um, people from, uh, from Kirsty's team uh, attending, please do let the tenant engagement team know, because we'd really like to support you in whatever way we can. So next on our agenda, thinking about other ways in which we can work in a sustainable way, um, is um, to think about our greening city, our green city, and in particular, the tree planting that is planned for the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. But there's so much more that's planned for the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. Um, and so I'm really, um, I'm really happy to um, invite Craig, who is our, Craig Lintot, who is our events manager to, to do this presentation. Craig, I'm not sure if you've spoken at um, previous conferences in person um, or indeed online, but welcome to the conference and I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Mary. And this is the first time for me. So um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today to tell you about some of the activities that are planned for the Platinum Jubilee this year. I've been told I have uh, three minutes, so I better crack on. Uh, next slide, please. You've, you, we're, we're about a minute ahead, Craig, so right, you can probably I'll, I'll take four or five. OK, thank you. Um, so as you know, the Platinum Jubilee is a celebration of the Queen's uh, 70 years of service. And you may all be pleased to know that to mark this occasion, there's an extended four day bank holiday window um, that runs from the 2nd until the 5th of June. Uh, next slide, please. As Mary mentioned, as part of the celebrations, uh, Southampton has been announced as one of the first uh, champion cities for the Green, Queen's Green Canopy Initiative. It's very difficult to say that. Uh, this was launched last year and it's, um, it's designed uh, to encourage people across the country to plant a tree for the Jubilee to mark this historic milestone. Um, to help the environment to make local areas greener, people are going to be urged to create this special gift for the Queen. So far, we have already planted 70 trees at uh, Thornhill Green. And then I found out today there's another 70 trees going into Riverside Park next week. Uh, next slide, please. Along with the Jubilee, this year is also a special year for the city and in particular its mayor. Uh, so this year, after May, the mayor will be the 800th mayor of Southampton, or the 800th, yeah, the 800th mayor of the town and city. Um, 
and sort of to mark this occasion and the Jubilee, the, the Mayor wants to invite people who are celebrating their 70th birthday in 2022 for afternoon tea in the Mayor's parlour. Um, this actually went out on a local press release last week um, and um, it's been well received so we've had some people who are interested in doing it already but we just need to work out the mechanics of how we're going to do it and if we're oversubscribed then we'll just select the applicants uh, at random so that's looking quite good and it's um, if you've never been to the Mayor's parlour it's certainly worth uh, going to have a look around next to a really interesting place. Uh, next slide please. Well um, more than anything over the years street parties have traditionally been associated with jubilees and uh, this platinum jubilee will be no exception. We've been really working really closely with our highways partner Balfour BT to ensure that the process for arranging any street parties is as simple as possible. There's going to be no cost to residents who wish to arrange a party apart from providing their own traffic management, although Balfour BT um, are really pleased to provide advice and assistance where they can. Uh, more details about the scheme and how to apply for the road closures is available on the Visit Southampton website. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, beacons, um, but then if you know beacons, these are featured in Jubilees well, for as long as anyone can remember, actually. So beacons are lit simultaneously throughout the UK, Channel Islands, Isle of Man, UK overseas territories, and across the country on the evening of the 2nd of June, uh, as part of the beacons project, um, there'll be loads of these beacons being lit. So um, there are set elements to the format of the event. So there's going to be the announcement of the lighting of the beacons the evening, uh, that evening by the town crier. That will be at the bar gate. Pi and then at nine o'clock, pipers will be playing uh, Du Ranieri. And then there'll be the lighting of the beacon at 9.15 p.m. I suppose that we'll do this activity around the Queen's Peace Fountain in East Park. Um, next slide, please. That's it, thank you. Uh, so Unity 101, the community radio station, they're based in the city. They're planning a special event at Mayflower Park to celebrate the Jubilee. They're looking to do their event on the 5th of June. Um, actually, they've recently changed the name of the event to the Big Platinum Festival. So since I wrote this slide, they've changed the name because it's Big Platinum Festival. Um, and this is building on the back of an event which took place in Mayflower Park to celebrate the Diamond Jubilee back in 20. 12. Um, so it's designed to be a family friendly event and the organiser expect up to about 5,000 people to attend. Things they've got going on are TV and radio studios, fire engines, police cars, chili and street food stalls, cooking, DJ demonstrations, they're looking to get the Hampshire FA there, at least cricket workshops, Saints Foundation circus workshops, Chinese dragon dancers, big platinum bands, they're still, they're still putting it together and they've um, they announced it last week so their website's live as well. So they're looking good so far. Next slide, please. I couldn't find a good picture, a photograph of red, white and blue on, but I did like this picture. So we're exploring options to decorate parts of the city centre in red, white and blue with some city dressings. Um, so apologies, I couldn't get a nice picture, but I actually really like that one. Um, next slide, please. We're also planning on illuminating various locations, red, white and blue for the Jubilee. So locations we have in mind are Queen's Park, where the um, we've, we've got lights there that can change colour. So you'll see the slides there as they change around. You can see we can put different filters and things in there. So that should look really good. Um, Civic Centre, primarily at the Art Gallery and the Library, and also the uh, O2 Guildhall as well. So yeah, that should look really good. The only downside is that time of the year is that there's not as many hours of darkness, but it's still going to look good. Um, next slide, please. So designs have been put in place for the Jubilee themed flower beds, or for Jubilee flower beds rather, in the city centre parks. Um, it's our intention to have a Union Jack flower bed in Palmerston Park, and there's going to be another two themed flower beds featuring red, white and blue plants in Watts Park. Next slide, please. And um, finally, I'd just like to say, if you want any additional information, just um, drop us a line in the chat, or if you've got any questions, um, you can just send me an email at events at southampton.gov.uk and we'll be happy to come back to you as soon as we can. Thank you. Craig, thank you very much. So much to look forward to later on this year. And, uh, and this will all, all be happening just before we get to the Women's Euros in July. And just after we hopefully have been announced as the winner of UK City of Culture for 2025. So 2022 is looking like a really busy year for the city. Um, so I, I'm going to take a bit of your time um, to, um, to pick up on, on the city of culture. Um, and just to do a very short presentation on, on, on where we're at and what we're hoping to achieve when we win City of Culture. So next slide, please, which I believe is a video that we're going to ask you to watch. Me, 
new Southampton's like a treasure chest. So many stories. And the good thing about Southampton is it's a welcoming city. It's part of you. You'll always find a space for you. Yeah, this is definitely a place I want to stay in at. And plus it's like part of my heritage as well. It's like where I want to be. It's where people will feel wanted and belong. As a writer and an artist, I started doing work that I'd never done before in Southampton. The way in which the city rebuilt itself, you've got like the ancient walls right next to modern buildings. And it's sort of a symbol of the way in which it's this kind of patchwork of different types of stories and different types of communities. And I'm really grateful for that because it means that everybody has a place. And I found my place here. There is a love for the music within the city. Bands want to play where they're going to have the best show. Southampton has a massive music here. With everyone working together as a city and united as one, I feel like Southampton really can be on the map and inspire other people to do the same. Southampton's always on the cusp of understanding if a band's going to be big, it will be like a sold-out show. It's just one of those things, isn't it? No, no handouts, so I had to take it. Late nights, no sleep on a daily basis. Told my mum I can't stop now, I've got to make it. I'm from the same city as Craig David. We all have flashbacks in our lives. I'm sitting there in command of the world's biggest ocean liner. I can just remember myself sitting on the stones on, on the beach off Western Shore there, just watching the Queen Mary or the Queen Elizabeth sailing in. I would never have imagined that I'd actually be in command of one of those ships and taking the ship myself into the Port of Southampton. What is it that we can give to people? What is it that Southampton can give to us? And what is it that we can give back to the community? It's about living, and we are living our dream. And that's happening right now. Yeah, so we want the world, world to know what's happening here in South Abdi. I never tire of watching that video um, and, and um, if I was jigging around in the middle of it, um, I do apologise, but I always find myself dancing in the middle bit of it. So um, hopefully some of you will have seen that video before, but if we can move on to the next slide, please. So just by way of a recap, for those of you who might not know, the UK City of Culture is a title that's given to one city or a place in, in Britain for one year. And it, it is a competition, so we do have to put forward the reasons why we want to be the winner judged by the Department for um, Digital Culture, Media and Sports. But the most important thing is that this is about people and it's about the opportunity for us as a city to celebrate what we do well, what things we want to improve, but how we want to come together um, using culture really as the glue that brings us together. It's really important to say that the definition of culture in this context is not about going to the theatre or going to the ballet, it is about everything. It's about our parks, it's about our places, it's about the history and heritage we saw in the video, the conversation around our heritage next to our modern buildings. It's about technology and it's about cinema, digital, sport and science. So what would it mean if we won? Well, it would provide the opportunity to have a year of so much going on, events happening all over the city, big, small, local and, and, um, and festivals that happen beyond that time. It would put us on the map regionally, internationally and nationally, and, and it would help to drive some economic recovery and accelerate, accelerate, accelerate growth um, following the pandemic. We do want to secure investment. We do want to secure global in, in, intervention within the city, but we also want to provide opportunity for the people who are already living here, the people who are already committed to this city and who live and love and learn in this city. Um, it is about cultural regeneration, but it is also about culture and pride. And I think somebody used the word pride earlier, and it is about building and demonstrating. Um, 
when other cities have won the title of UK City of Culture, they have seen huge benefits in terms of investment, in terms of jobs, in terms of businesses, and in terms of new skills. And we want to be part of that, that as well. Next slide, please. So this is just a, a, an at-a-glance guide to some of the things that have happened in other cities um, when they've won. So Hull, for example, 800 new jobs, 6 million visitors during the year, and investment in the city um, of more than 17 million added value. Um, so I think it's really important. And in terms of engagement, Hull had 56,000 young people involved in activities and volunteering. It's our plan that we will smash those numbers when we win City of Culture. We want every street to have volunteers who are involved in this. So who are we up against? Well, we're up against these um, seven places across the UK. Um, at, because we have already been long listed to the last eight. There were about 20 applicants who put forward an expression of interest earlier this year. Next slide, please. And what's the timeline? So there is a team of um, colleagues within the City Council and within um, our UK um, City of Culture bid team, led by Claire Whitaker, who actually came to our conference this time last year, um, who are beavering away writing our final bid because we have to submit that bid on the 2nd of February. So we're about 10 days away from putting our bid in. So it's a really tight deadline. Um, we will hopefully be shortlisted. Well, we will be shortlisted and we hope to hear about that in early March. Um, and then we will have judges visiting the city in April with decisions being made at the end of May and announced at the end of May. Vicky, I've never been to Wrexham. I'm sure it's a lovely place for the people who live there. Um, and uh, so who's involved in the UK, our bid to be UK City of Culture? Well, it's been led by the Southampton 2025 Trust and a whole range of partners. We have got, um, within that, the City Council is a key partner, University of Southampton, Solent University, um, and trustees of Go Southampton as well. But we've also got some independent trustees. And we were really pleased before Christmas to be able to announce that our, the new chair of our Southampton 2025 Trust is Shalina Permalu, who I'm sure many of you um, know, um, have met, and Shalina is in Southampton. She's the winner of uh, MasterChef. She's got her own um, restaurant, but she's also very, very committed to working with the communities across the whole city. Some of you may know that she, um, she committed a huge amount of work over Christmas to supporting the provision of a Christmas Day um, lunch for many of our local looked after children. We have a huge number of um, local ambassadors and people involved and I know Linda's been very very involved for somebody who's on my screen at the moment. Peter Hull who's a Paralympian and Larry Kaczynski who is one of our youth coordinators as well. We've got businesses who are very very involved um, at a local level, at a regional level and an international level. Um, and uh, um, we've uh, secured some really big partnerships with some of the big organisations within the city. Next slide, please. So, make it so. This is, this is our um, badge of uh, honour that we would like you to use this language. If you do have a Facebook account, if you've got a Twitter account, please follow the Southampton 2025 Twitter account. Please follow our Facebook account. Please tweet, retweet um, or, or share Facebook messages. We are up against um, the stiffest competition we think is Bradford, if I'm honest. We think that's our biggest competition and Bradford are making quite a bit of noise in the, in, in the social media state. So we'd like, to, we'd like to get close to them. So if you or your family um, use social media, please do follow us and, uh, and, and make it so for Southampton. I think that's the last slide. Well, uh, we are a little bit over time, but that's my fault for not keeping us to time. But hopefully we, we will we'll make up a bit of time or we won't keep you much longer than seven o'clock. So I'm going to hand over now to Lindsay um, from our city services team is going to talk to us about the um, estate greening and the new meadows um, across the city. So over to you, Lindsay. Thank you, Mary. And good evening, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. I'm just going to give a, a very quick sort of overview of our uh, meadows project. Uh, next slide, please. So hopefully you will have seen some of our meadows around the city. Um, these are they're really diverse habitats. Uh, they support a, ride, a wide range of wildlife. So insects such as butterflies and bees, birds, reptiles and amphibians, right through to, to large mammals such as deer. So due to their importance, we decided that there needed to be a target within the Greener City Action Plan. And the one we came up with was to create 25 new meadows over five years. 
Um, I can say now that by March of this year, we will have achieved that target two years early. We also uh, have a target of improving the management of our existing meadows. We're going to support community groups who want to create new meadows. And we're also hopefully going to find some volunteers who will join with my ecologist, Sam Munslow, to go out and survey these meadows and find out what we've got there. Next slide, please. Yep. Um, so basically, what is a meadow? Well, essentially, it's habitat that comprises grasses and flowers. Uh, we've got different types of meadows. So you might see chalk downland, which tends to be really short, very diverse, lots of sort of pretty flowers like wild thyme. Or you might have heard of the upland hay meadows, which are um, up on the, in the Yorkshire Dales. Essentially, though, they are all just habitats that are maintained by cutting and removing the vegetation. Cutting used to be done by grazing animals such as cattle, but now we have to use mowers. If we stop mowing, the grass then will change back to woodland, uh, which presents a big problem for us. So here is a map showing all the meadows across the city. Um, as you see, this is more than our, our 25. They are scattered around. Um, so we've got semi-natural meadows on Southampton Common and Pear Tree Green. We've got bits of converted amenity grasslands, such as at Sheldrake Gardens. And we've got some newly seeded areas on buns around parks, such as those at Veracity Recreation Ground. Next slide, please. So why do we need to conserve meadows? Well, we decided to take action because species rich meadows, which are the best for wildlife, have declined by 97% since the 1930s, and they now cover less than 1% of the UK. Woodland cover, in contrast, has increased from 12% cover of the UK in 1988 to 13.2% now. So woodland, despite a lot of the talk, is actually doing a lot better than grasslands. Grasslands are particularly important for pollinator species, which are vital for food production. It's been estimated that globally, one in three mouthfuls of food actually depend on insect pollination. Next slide, please. So, as I mentioned, um, grasslands need cutting. Um, we haven't got any livestock these days, so we use machines. But the problem we've got is that, unlike cattle, uh, machines generally drop the, the cuttings. So we've got some special, a couple of special machines. We've got a profi hopper, which is the little machine in the picture, and that will cut the grass. And then there's a, a, an Archimedes screw underneath, which collects all the arisings and then they get put into the little hopper behind where the driver sits. We also have a pedestrian mower which we, is called an Allen scythe and this has got a big reciprocating blade on it which cuts the grass a bit like scissors will and then we can put a baler onto the machine instead and then we drive it over the cuttings and create a big roll of grass which we can then move somewhere where it doesn't matter. If you don't remove the cuttings unfortunately the they mop, rot down like mulch, like compost, and then it, the soil becomes too rich and we end up with just nettles and docks, which is not so good for wildlife and doesn't look great either. Next slide, please. So, as I said, they all need to be cut, but they're cut at different times of the year, depending on what sort of plants we've got and what wildlife they support. So annual meadows, which are the plants that will flower and set seed all in a year, generally on bare ground. So we're thinking like poppies, that sort of thing. They're really good for pollinator species. And they receive what we call a hay cut, which is done in July or August. I know people get upset because all the flowers disappear, but often uh, once they've been cut and the, collect, the, the arising is collected, the plants will actually put some more flowers on. Perennial meadows um, are flowers that will grow from year to year. We leave those to set seed, so we won't actually cut those until the autumn or the winter. And then we have what's what we call permanent meadows, and those are the meadows which have been left to grow uncut for a long time, and they develop a, a tussocky structure, which is good for small mammals, uh, lizards, sort of reptiles like lizards and slow worms. They can hide in the tussocks of grass. These are only cut occasionally, and we do that to stop trees growing in the grassland. Next slide, please. So 
In terms of creating new meadows, one of the best ways of doing that is to just stop the regular mowing and see what's already there. This picture shows a patch of grassland on the bank outside the front of the Civic Centre. And when the, the mowing was stopped, we had this really nice patch of ladies' bed straw. Having, if you do that and you find you haven't got any wildflowers, you can dig over some of the existing turf so that you've just got soil, and then you can sow annual seeds on it, and you'll get a really quick uh, display of flowers such as poppies, corn cockles. That's quite intensive because you have to keep chain, digging the soil every, every year. So alternatively, you can plant plug plants into the turf and those will, will cope with the, the grass and they will grow from year to year. So plants that we do that with are things like oxide daisy, uh, uh, like knapweed, uh, bird's foot trefoil. Next slide, please. So here is a, a picture, a diagram and a picture of um, some volunteers from the SO18 big local group in Townhill Park. They're busy planting, um, digging over some soil so that they can plant some annual seeds on Somerset Avenue. And as you can see from the diagram, the intention is to run the, um, the, the, the pattern all the way up the, the avenue. So the seeds have now been sown. We had some, fl some flowers over the, um, the summer, as you can see here. And this autumn, they've now gone in and planted some more plug plants into the, the patch of grass where, the, the longer grass where there isn't any flowers. And the maintenance team have stopped regular mowing of the, the whole avenue. And so the, the, the flowers are gonna be extended on along the avenue. And then we will get the coffee hopper in to cut and collect the grass and hopefully uh, in a few years time we'll end up with a real long swathe of wildflowers all the way up the avenue. Next slide please. And this is my final slide. This is actually an area of wildflower grasslands that we managed to get included in a highway improvement scheme. This is part of the Wyndham Place highway improvement scheme which is located outside Central Station. As you can see there's all sorts of flowers um, and they're looking really good. And when I had a look at them, they were absolutely covered in, in bees and other insects. So just in conclusion, if anybody has any idea for suitable locations for some more wildflowers, um, please feel free to get in touch with me. My engagement officers will be happy to help uh, come up with a scheme. Thank you. Lindsay, thank you very much. I feel like I've learned quite a lot about the, uh, the different equipment that one uses to, to support wildflower meadows, which I didn't know before. So thank you very much for, for helping us understand that. So moving swiftly on as um, time is, 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 is of the essence. So I'm going to introduce you to Ola on a Ola is a service manager who is leading our asset management strategy. And she's been joined today by David Hockaday, who's our stock condition and data manager. And I would say Ola and David have been working tirelessly to make sure that we've got plans going forward to make sure that your homes are energy efficient, but also that our capital programme um, is, 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 is responsive and robust for the, for the years ahead. So over to you, Ola and David. Uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you for inviting me along. Just for confirmation purposes, I'm David and I'm joined by Ola. So I'll be taking you through the uh, number of slides and then hopefully either Ola or myself will answer any questions you may have on the chat. So first slide, please. OK, so to give a bit of uh, background, I think we've touched through a number of the presentations on the decarbonisation uh, strategy, not only for the UK, but for Southampton City Council. Uh, and more directly, the increasing energy costs and the affordability of energy for, for, for residents and for businesses themselves. So. We really want to make sure that we've got the strategy in place to ensure that uh, all of our properties meet the government's performance standards. So they as measured in EPCs, and I'll cover that a little bit later on, but achieve a target of C for all domestic housing. So next slide, please. So to give you some idea, the decarbonisation is going to affect all of us. And I've put in a little um, timeline to give you some of the key points uh, up to 2040. So gas boilers in new buildings will be stopped from 2025. And that is used to, in terms of space heating for around 70% of homes in the UK. 
So there's a real fundamental change coming to the way that we heat our homes. Um, if you drive a petrol diesel car by 2030, uh, that will change to electric cars for new vehicles. And the government have also set a standard uh, in 2035 of all homes, uh, social homes and private homes, meeting an EPC rating of C in terms of its energy performance. And again, to support the wider um, city's ambition of meeting net zero by 2040. Next slide, please. So where does our current housing stock sit? We have just under 19,000 properties in the domestic property portfolio and 14, 000, just over 14,000 have EPCs, um, 4,600 don't and uh, we're currently doing a large scale um, survey of our properties to improve that number. And we have around 7,500 homes that are fed and heated by uh, gas-fired central heating and around 6,800 that are electrically heated. We do have around 5,000 homes on district heating systems. So as you can see from the two graphs, e, an EPC gives you two measures. It gives you the current performance level of the property, and these are individual to each property, and a potential outcome if you carry out some improvements. And you can see here on the left-hand side where our current um, position is. Uh, without any improvement. So you can see we've got very few in the top box, which is B. Um, the C rating that we're trying to achieve, we, we, we're doing fairly well. We've got a lot of properties in the D band, some in E, some in F, and some in G. Now, if we carry out the improvement measures, which I'll talk about a little bit later on, you can see that we will remove all of our G rated properties, and the vast majority will shift up into the C band. And effectively, that means that a property from E to C means that you will require about half the energy input to heat your home you currently do. So it's really important that we do that. Next slide, please. So this is how um, EPCs are banded. I'm sure you've seen on a lot of domestic appliances, a sticker giving you its energy performance rating from A to G. And you can very quickly see that our current uh, rating as an average across our, our housing portfolio is a D rated and our target is C. And again, for new builds from 2022, they're looking for all new builds to achieve a B rated status. Next slide, please. So this is a bit of a, a complicated graph with a complicated name, marginal attainment cost curve. And what you're looking here is for very low very wide bands and that effectively tells you the value for money more bang for your buck effectively and you can see towards the left hand side loft insulation offers us the best increase in terms of energy performance for homes and it gives us uh, 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 the best value for money and the four key bands you will see and where i've got the blue is our phase one what we're doing to upgrade our properties, which is loft insulation, cavity wall fill, uh, high efficiency electric heaters, and double glazing and new doors. Next slide, please. So what's our investment over the next five years? And I think we touched on in Kevin's presentation that we reviewed our capital spending and we've changed the priority slightly to really to invest in our energy performance. So we're spending every year for the next five years, 1.3 million on loft insulation, two and a half million on new doors and windows, half a million pounds on external wall insulation, and 3.6 million on space heating. So to give you some idea, we're doubling our investment in, in gas boilers. And for the first time ever, we are gonna have a wide scale program to replace night storage heaters with uh, Dimplex Quantum which are high efficiency electric heating. And that will save residents around 26 to 27% on their energy bill. So as you can see, we talked about the decarbonisation um, strategy. And what this graph demonstrates is that with electrical heating, the grid with renewables and nuclear power coming on stream will decarbonise the main grid 
by about 50% by 2040. And you can see that the green straight blue line there is gas and there's, we can't decarbonize gas. And the government is saying effectively by 2040, they want to see the end of fossil fuels used to space heat our homes. So that's just to give you a demonstration of that curve dropping off. So what are we doing? Um, well, we're looking at a warmer homes demonstrator um, and we're looking at a, a block of flats and what we can do to that block of flats really to bring it from where it is now at a D and an E right up to a B. And uh, we're speaking with external architects about what we can do. Uh, direct investment from the capital programme we talked about, and there's some significant investment going on there. But I think the exciting area for us is increasing the funding that we're spending. And we can seek to do that through the government funding, um, through the social decarbonisation fund. And to give you some idea of how big that fund is, it's 830 million over the next three years. And uh, we're already trying to get some money in from that. And hopefully we'll have some quite exciting news really soon. And improving our estate's data. So if we want to get any funding, the first thing is we must know what our, how our housing stock performs. So next slide, please. So the future, we're definitely going to have to design a new space heating system for our properties when we start to reduce our legacy gas. Um, we'll be trialling various retrofit uh, demonstrators across various archetypes. And um, we'll be redefining our asset model so that we include uh, an energy performance calculation within that. Um, we'll be looking very widely across industry, um, what technologies are coming on. So the government's favourite uh, um, replacement for gas boilers is air source heat pumps. So they come with a lot of problems and that's a, a developing technology. But there's lots of evolving technology which we really think will be suitable. So we don't want to move too quickly. We want to see what the market will deliver in terms of new technologies. We're investing in renewables and really exciting, I think. We, we're really aligned and joined up with our energy performance team. So the asset management team and the energy team working on a joint vision of one, how we improve the energy performance of our properties and two, sitting alongside that, how we decarbonise to meet the government and city targets going forward. That's the end. If you've got any questions, pop them in the chat and either me or Ola will try our very hardest to answer them for you. But thank you for inviting me tonight. Thank you very much. I have to say it's pretty exciting. Um, we had a conversation in uh, a group of us earlier today. We had a conversation a couple of weeks ago on, on, this, on this work, but also building, I think, very much on work that's already been underway here in Southampton for some time, but really taking it forward. Um, Kim, in terms of the Southampton Healthy Homes Initiative, we'll have to pick that up offline. Um, I think it's slightly different, but we can we can make sure that everybody gets some information about that. I'm not going to keep you for very long, um, but I just wanted to say thank you very much to all of our presenters today. Um, I have certainly learned an enormous amount, so just to, to do a bit of a name check. So thank you very much to Councillor Vassilou for, for, for um, setting the scene this evening, to Megan from Travis Perkins and from for Kevin for setting the budget outline. We were joined by Kirsty who talked about um, recycling and Craig talked about the, the Platinum Jubilee year. Um, I'd also like to thank Lindsay and Ola and David um, for all of your in informative presentations this evening. It's been, it's been a huge amount covered in actually a fairly short amount of time. And finally, I'd like to echo the comments um, of Councillor Vassilou earlier today um, and thank all of the tenant engagement team. So Lepsa, Sean and the team, uh, Michael, who has been driving slides for us this evening. Really, really thank you um, for, for putting this together. I know we had all hoped that we would be meeting in, in person again, as we had in September, um, but we will work towards our summer conference, most definitely being together um, again um, this year in 2022. So I'm afraid I haven't achieved the target of, of, of making the deadline of seven o'clock, um, but 10 past seven, hopefully is okay for most people and you're not dying of hunger. Um, and uh, I, I look forward to seeing you all in 2022 um, as, as we go forward on this exciting journey um, to, in, to be more sustainable and to improve um, the environment in which we're, we're all living, working every single day. So thank you everyone, and thank you to the team. And can I just say thank you very much, Mary, for, for chairing the conference. So 
brilliantly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, everyone.